So I'm going to talk about what, I, what we call in the paper I, I gave to you, a fourth industrial revolution concept, the most famous one, the most important one, the one on which I will focus mostly is Industry for Zero, and it stands for the fourth industrial revolution. So it's a concept that has been around for almost 10 years that is claiming that there is a fourth industrial revolution happening right here, right now. And what I'm going to tell you in a nutshell is that when we look at this through the automotive sector, we get to the conclusion that there is no such a thing as a fourth industrial revolution, but that does not mean that this concept is not having consequences or effects on the automotive industry. But it's not a revolution, it's something else. So, for the introduction I will focus, so i just give you the plan, so I will focus for on what is Industry for Zero and the other related concept because it's like family of them. So you have advanced manufacturing in the United States, you have Made in China 25, which is a government-sponsored project on digital technology in China. You have Industrie du Futur in France that is a sort of copy and paste of the German Industry for Zero. So you have a lot of these concepts which are also consortium of firms and actors which are pushing this technological transformation. So what is, uh, what is this concept? And I will try to develop kind of two angles on that. I will describe these concepts as political projects. So if there's a fourth industrial revolution is not happening, it is because the concept itself is not describing something. It wants to bring something into reality. So it's more like uh, and sort of advertisement of the idea that a fourth industrial revolution could happen. And as a hype. Now the terms hype or fashion or fad could be immediately seen as a negative thing. So, okay, it's just a hype. It happens and it goes. But in the scientific literature that deals with hypes, like in science and technological studies or in organizational studies for what is called managerial fashions, or more recently in economics with the concept of performativity, the idea that economic theories perform the world, they do not describe the world, but change the way the world uh, works. All these concepts are taken very seriously. A hype is not something that doesn't have effects in the world. It's actually something that can have very powerful effects. But it doesn't bring into existence what it describes. It does something else. And then I will focus on what is already what could be in the future, the impact that Industry for Zero concept and the other brothers and sisters has had so far on the automotive sectors, in particular in work and employment, because there has been a kind of a generalized anxiety about automation, which has spurred out of this concept, uh, in particular after 2014, 2015. So I will focus a little bit on that. And um, uh, so that is, is, is basically the plan. Uh, we will have time for discussion and question and answer after, but if, you, if I say something that is unclear, either because of my pronunciation or just because the concept is not clear and you want to have more information, don't, do not hesitate to raise your hands so I can provide uh, the information needed. So uh, just a little bit of background on how I got into this topic, and I would say it's been rather the other way around. The topic came to me. It's not like I wanted to study Industry for Zero, I just did not have the choice. I am a specialist of the automotive industry. As David said, I'm Director of International Network of Research and Social Science on the automotive industry. The automotive industry is the main employer of industrial workers worldwide, is one of the main sectors in terms of R&D, and is also the main buyer and user of robots and automated technology. So clearly that was a sector that was uh, from the beginning identified as the forefront, at the forefront, the front runner of Industry for Zero Transformation. So very early on in 2013-14, stakeholders from the industry and the Ministry of Industries in France came to me and say, you need to study that. So I didn't have the choice. Uh, and then there's been a second phase in which people from the International Labour Organization came to me, more or less with the same demands, because they were very much concerned that this transformation would actually lead to a massive technological unemployment with a huge displacement of workers due to the fact that there is a new generation of robots which are more clever, which are more flexible, which can be integrated in database computed cloud system. And so the idea is that, well, this is going to happen and we have to deal with that. So that is the background. And so I've done two research projects, research projects in two phases 
on the topic of future of work in the automotive industry and the article that you have read uh, and you're going to discuss comes exactly from one of these projects. And so I've written together with Martin Grzynski, who's a sociologist from VZB in Berlin, and Boy Luce, who works at the Sun Yat-sen University in Shanghai. So what is Industry for Zero? So sorry, this is not very easy to, easy to read slide, but I hope there will not be many of them like that. So let's just read the manifesto. Okay, so this is the manifesto of Industry for Zero. It was produced by the Industry for Zero Working Group in 2013. And when you read it, and you are familiar with what I would call managerial fashion or hot managerial topics, you will find many of them there. Not new, old ones. For example, you will find the idea that smart factories allow individual customer requirement, last minute change, customization. This is a topic that has been around in particular in the automotive industry for 30 years. Why? Because car makers want to reduce what they produce to stock because they don't know if later on they can, they're capable of selling that and perhaps if the markets change they are charged with stock which is very expensive. So, the dream is just produced to order, built to order. But they've tried to do that uh, many times and they've systematically failed because it's too difficult. Of course, they produce part of their production to order, but most of it because we are in the mass production environment and you don't decide how many cars you produce to be profitable. You just have to produce them. Well, most of the cars are still produced to stock. So this is nothing new, but it comes here. So this is this idea of end-to-end -end transparency. This is an this is something that comes out from the fact that the industry has been changing a lot during the last 30 years with value chains, structuring uh, the way in which products are made throughout the world, and so it becomes more complicated to know where parts are, where are produced, in which quantity. So the idea is to respond to some of these needs, and the last part is about uh, small business, uh, sort of the startup nation, coming back to small is beautiful, and this Revolution is expected to allow small firms to scale up their innovation much faster, notably with additive manufacturing. So again, it's something that is not very new. And finally, this, um, this again is not very new, the idea that this technology will finally allow to free workers from repetitive tasks, from uh, tasks that are heavy and difficult to carry out, and so to just let people do creative things. Uh, that's why then you see the anxiety about uh, employment is because, of course, if you let people just do creative things and innovation, there are a lot of workers who do not do that and will not be able to do that, what we do with them. So, this is in terms of kind of say, the speech, okay, there is nothing new there. Uh, it's not like a new productive model or a new radical concept that realign things. No, it's old managerial fashion packed together. And then you see the technologies, all these technologies also have been around for some years. Some are more mature than others, some are more new than others, but the idea that they work together and they can be combined together, that is new, but it's not clear how actually you achieve that. So you have the Internet of Things, uh, which is the idea of just moving Internet from computers to parts, machines, human beings all interconnected with each other, so you have a constant flow of information about what they do, what they are, parts will tell a worker if they have a quality problem to you, where they're coming from, and so on. Then you have the ideas of additive manufacturing, 3D printing, which is the idea of moving from big scale production to the capacity of doing uh, things in a small scale and not by stamping and welding together parts, but just by using new materials and 3D printing to make complex design. Uh, the problem of these technologies is as, as as you can imagine, is a small-scale production. To scale up is very difficult. Then you have cobotics, or collaborative robots, or cobots. This is the idea of robots so far, and it's still mostly the case, are in island. When you go into a factory, there is islands where human beings cannot get into because it's too dangerous, and robots do welding, do stamping, but they don't interact with human beings. Too dangerous. And the idea of co-robots, or collaborative robots is that you have a new generation of robots that can interact with human beings and then can be put in the assembly line together with human beings to help them doing the job and eventually substituting for them. And what is ties everything together is the idea that all these things will produce data, a lot of data. 
and then you will have artificial intelligence who will gather this data together and will optimize and manage the supply chain. And, and that is, is what is, it, it really creates the idea of a cloud, big cloud manufacturing system in which all the suppliers of, for a given product, all the people who conceive the product, all the people that take care of the logistic, all the people that uh, assemble the products, all the people who sell the products, will be all connected together. And all this flow will be constantly monitored by artificial intelligence with all this technology that you are now familiar with, which is machine learning or neuro neuronal network, and they will constantly improve the flow. So flexibility, efficiency, uh, more into free the innovation of smaller and, and, and medium-sized companies and the elimination of repetitive tasks. So this is the promise of the brave new world of Industry for Zero. Um, some colleagues have pointed out that when you look at this technology and you know the history of this technology, what we are actually looking at is not really a revolution because, again, there is nothing specific new about these things. Digitalization in manufacturing has been going on for 20, 30 years. What is new is the willingness to integrate all these realities. So you have a lot of digital technology in manufacturing, and just they are not integrated together. And to use new communication technology to achieve that, so that hardware, software, and communication will be more tightly integrated. But they clearly argue, and I think they're right, we're more dealing with an evolutionary process, which builds upon things that were already there for many years that simply were not really working. There were a lot of difficulties to create the digital factories, and we will see that it's still more or less the case. So I will develop uh, now two stream of analysis. The first is that the industry for zero was so successful that it has triggered, as I said before, a lot of anxiety about the idea that robots will take over all the jobs with few exceptions. And so we will talk about the debate about future that has been triggered by this concept. And then I will turn into Industry for Zero as political concept. So who have made this concept? For what purpose? What is at stake behind a concept like Industry for Zero? It doesn't describe in something that is happening. So what is doing? And as a hype. So as a hype, as, a, as again, it's not as a hype as scientific concept that describes something that becomes very popular and has a lot of influence on the real world for a certain amount of time, very fast. And then it fades away. Uh, that, that's the idea of the hype in, in social science. But when it fades away, it leaves behind concrete efforts. It's not like nothing has happened. So the question is, what has happened? And I will look into the automotive sector to provide you sort of window of what has been happening in this process. Okay, is that clear? Any question on just the plan or what I've been saying that is not clear? Do not hesitate. If you say, I don't understand something or something you just say, I've never heard before this word, what does it mean? Uh, or please raise the hand, it will make everything clear for everybody. So debates about the future. The debates about the future did not really come from industry for zero concept per se. Actually, when you look at the industry for zero concept, the manifesto I just show you, there is not much about robots and there is not much about automation. So it was more that the concept kind of find a fertile ground to induce this uh, automation anxiety. And this was the literature that we normally consider as routine bias and tax bias technological change, and which basically m is mainly made by economists. So uh, for example, you have an influential book which is called The Second Machine Age of 2014, which clearly says robots are cheaper, more flexible, and clever. And in, on the top of that, you have artificial intelligence, so they will substitute for everything, not just uh, the routine jobs in manufacturing, but also the routine jobs in uh, health, uh, like the diagnosis of somebody sick, it will be done by an artificial intelligence, not anymore by a doctor using a database. Uh, judgment in tribunal, again, it can be sub you can use a computer and artificial intelligence and use all the database about past judgments to let the computer do that without bias. And so uh, we have seen many, many uh, articles which have been very influential in the literature in the last five, six years that look at task. 
So they don't look at job. They look at specific tasks that people do, and they try to establish how much routinized are them. If they're routinized, is, is a routine, is a repetitive job which is always the same, well, this can be automated. And on the basis of these kind of, they use experts to estimate the degree of automation of task, and then they consider all the tasks together, and they come up with these results. For example, this is a, a Boston Consulting Group, uh, uh, so the big global consultant have taken that, of course, as, as a business opportunity because they sell, uh, they, they sell their services to companies, so they say, companies, you need to be ready to, to this. And so they say, for example, in the automotive sector, only 8% of tasks, so they, they look just at the tasks, are automated and it could be 53 in the United States and 85 at the world level, and this would happen in 10 years. So they claim that by 2030, 85% of tasks that are currently carried out by human beings will be carried out by automated things, robots or other kind of artificial intelligence. Now, the most influential one is Frayn and Osborne. Have you heard of them before? If you Google them, you will find four or 5,000 of citations for an article published, well, eight years ago is quite amazing. So again, the same kind of analysis, and they came up with the conclusion that 47% of jobs in the United States are at risk of automation and 84% in the automotive sector. So apocalypse, uh, trying to imagine 84% of jobs in the automotive sector, which is, for example, is the main employer in Germany, just going, disappearing in, in 10 years' time. And that's why the ILO came to us. I was, was very afraid that that was actually true, and you have a lot of other studies following the same approach. This has been criticized, both theoretically and empirically. And well, the most strong critic is, is David Author, is, is, an, is an American economist, and say this automation anxiety is nothing new. We've seen that in the past. It didn't, it didn't produce any of the efforts that, that these doom prophecies uh, pretend they would do, so it, it, would, it would be the same. Every time you automate a task, there are other tasks that are not automated, they gain in values. And so what, what changes is the skills, what changes is the, the way in which occupation evolve, but jobs are still there and they're not destroyed. And they use the, the idea of, of Polanyi paradox, which is not the economist Polanyi, it's the philosopher Polanyi, so just, just to avoid confusion. They're both hung from Hungary, but they're different person. And he says that we know more than we, we can tell, so it's the tacit knowledge. So what you automated is standard task but there is much more in the jobs that people do, and these actually do not get automated and increase in values. And also, it says that uh, an interesting thing is, is, is that so there's been other works that have been done with this approach, and from, you see, from 47%, they went down to 8% of jobs that would currently at risk, at potential at risk for 2030. But, Author says automation increased the polarization of jobs. So one of the effects of the automation is that when you, you, tends to, you, you tends to see more jobs moving towards higher education profiles because you need people that have to monitor or program or manage these more automated production environment. And then you need still people to take care of like lower skills, uh, tasks that remain that need uh, common sense, judgment, movement, and flexibility at the shop floor. And so you would see a polarization of jobs that author says it comes from automation. Uh, I will not get into this debate, but I think it's important also to, to think this in terms of power and power relations. Because what the automation does, according to author, it was the management wants it to do. Management is afraid of skilled workers, been afraid of skilled workers, in particular in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, is perhaps a little bit less afraid today, but skilled workers have power. They know how to do things, and if they go into strike, uh, you cannot replace them. So there have been always important level in trade union movements. So targeting the skilled workers in the middle of the hierarchy is not very surprising if you think that in terms of power relations, if you are weakening labor, you're enforcing employer power. So, Yes, perhaps it's the effect of automation, yet let's not forget about power and social relationship in the shop floor. Okay, so that is about the debates about the future. So there's been this big fear and then a reaction saying, well, come on, this is not really happening. 
And I will go back to the automotive sector and the evidence from the automotive sector that are really more on the right side of the slides I just showed you. This is not really happening rather than on the left side. Oh my God, all the, work, all the jobs are disappearing. Now, let me move to what is Industry for Zero. So if it's not describing the apocalypse, what is doing? Sorry. When you look at the working group of the Industry for Zero coordinators, you don't see many scientific person, you see business leaders. All right, so this is being promoted by business leaders and all these companies are technological providers. So they want to sell these technologies. To whom? They want to sell to the state, they want to sell to small and medium-sized companies, they want to say to the big manufacturing companies, in Germany, the automotive industry. And uh, so what they are trying to do is to capture, in particular, state money, state institutions, uh, public research, and to focus them on their technological domain. So that's what they are trying to do. And that's how you understand these as a political project. And why they are doing that is because, so you see here is the German main industrial sector, you have the transport equipment, which is the automotive industry, you have the machinery and equipment, which is Bosch, for example, big supplier of the auto industry, but also supplier of machines and robots. You have the electric and optical equipment, big company like Siemens, that you must be familiar with, and then you have the IT and other information services, which is pretty small by comparison to what you have in the United States. That would be the main economic set in the United States. You see, it's, it's not really the case in Germany. But you have quite important companies like SAP, which sells software to enterprise to manage the supply chain, to manage their schedules, to manage their factories. So these are the main actors behind Industry for Zero, not the car sector, but mainly these three ones. They are those who join together to create the Industry for Zero platform. And you see that, well, their sales were not growing very fast. The 2000 have not been here of fast growth for this sector and the financial crisis of 2009-2010 has been precisely the time in which they decide to push forward the Industry for Zero concept to react to these problems. So this is, in a nutshell, the dynamic of Industry for Zero. If you look back at its origin, you will find a small marginal project that was sponsored by the Ministry of Research, not the Ministry of Economy, but the Ministry of Research, in, in 2006 uh, and create the Industry Science Research Alliance, but really things start to scale up with the crisis and with the big companies stepping to that in 2009, 2010, and that gave uh, birth to the Industry for Zero consortium and then to the Industry for Zero platform that is now under the umbrella of the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Economy and receive a lot of public money annually around 10, 11 billion euros of public research, of fundings, go into the Industry for Zero Consortium. And the main stake of this platform has been, I mean, there have been defensive stakes and more offensive stakes. The offensive stake is to create a new market. As you see, the markets were not growing fast, so let's create a new market about in which we sell both digital technology, SAP, and manufacturing technology all together. And we sell the whole package. We, all, we not only sell robots, we also sell software, we also sell services to companies. So let's create this new market. But this new market is contested because if digital technology and manufacturing technology merge, well, the big players in digital technology are not German, are American. So the GAFA start to take an interest into that. It starts to look into the industry of things. So we need to protect ourselves. So a strong argument about industry for the year is that if we do not react now, the big tech groups, American groups, will take over. We control these new businesses. So we need the state behind us to fight against them. So that is more the defensive stake. And another defensive stake is China. China is becoming a big producer of machines and robots and digital technology and is also the main market for the German industry by far. So, we, so the Germans say we need to keep control of this key market. So they came up with what is called RAMI4, which is basically technological standards. So the point is not 
that the, the, the revolution is taking place is that they are struggling to define the grounds on which this revolution can take place and so to control the standards. So Ramis is for Industry for Zero architecture and you can see this, the key words here you don't see is e, e, I, e, C, which is the international standards. So they want to shape international standards and then are introduced all around the world to define the foundations on which this transformation will take place. Then you have also the fact that Germans, again, entrepreneurs have been very active and very successful in creating uh, opportunity for looking for money at the European level. So this is a Daimler sponsor project, uh, who, it's called EU Money, Money Future of 2004. It has evolved in factory of future. And you can see that now is in 2014-2040, 20, it provided 7 billion euros, which is, which is a substantial sum, to finance a uh, research project. And so, of course, the German companies were very active in, in getting this money. Now, when you look at the United States, it's a completely different story. If you look at advanced manufacturing, which is the sister or brother concept of Industry for Zero, it's really about national defense. It's really about the military technological complex is about the risk of seeing United States not having the manufacturing capability to produce the high-tech products of tomorrow. It's about new materials, okay? So if you look at public fundings in the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, uh, and it's really about defense. It's Boeing, it's Lockheed, it's uh, Ford that when he produced military vehicles. It's not at all about smart manufacturing. But when you look at the Industrial Internet Consortium, private completely sponsor, there you see the other side. It's digital companies, so Cisco, ATT, IBM, Intel, that says we need to take control of the indust industrial internet of things, and so they create another standards, which is called ERA, which is, again, the, the, the objective is, so is a struggle in defining the standards for a future market. So that are the stakes behind these political projects. And all these actors need the state support in order to do that. And so they need to capture the state support. They need also to capture uh, the strategy of investment of companies early on to create a protective space to develop these new technologies. And you have in China, uh, the Made in China 25 project, which is extremely ambitious because China is trying to leapfrog in the all major industrial economies by moving directly to new sectors, to new technologies. So for example, it's the leader in the electric cars, and it wants to be the leader in platform-based manufacturing, which is possibly, possibly the most radical concept that you would find here, which is the idea of that you have a platform, for example, that allow you to produce cars. And companies do not produce cars anymore. They go to the platform, and they tell the platform, please produce a car for me. So the idea is to create like the equivalent of Uber, but not for transport, for producing cars, or for producing other goods. But this is very, very far from being a reality. But so Made in 25 is a kind of more radical approach to try to go a step farther in this evolution. And you have the small industry, Ausine du futur, Industrie du futur, which is the fact that France is, is a small player by comparison to Germany and United States. So what, what they do? But they just look around and in a very, uh, I'll say, institutional perspective, they just do what they either do. I mean, in, in a field of uncertainty, big companies, but also states, they just imitate. So they've just set up something very similar to Industry for Zero in Germany, just much smaller and much less effective. Okay, another point that is very important here is the fact that uh, there is a sort of disbalance between the capacity of digital actors to invest in these new technologies and the capacity of, of manufacturing companies. It's like they are in two completely different worlds. So I'll give you an example. Tesla, okay? You know what Tesla is? Of course, Tesla is evaluated seven times Volkswagen today, okay? It, its value is seven times Volkswagen. It's keep raising, okay? But it produces 20 times less cars than Volkswagen and it generates 40 times less than profits, okay? So that means that a very small company like Tesla can raise a huge amount of money that doesn't even know what to do, so it can invest in all, the, all fields of technologies. And this is true for Amazon, for Google, for all these companies. While these German companies do not at all benefit from this kind of 
capacity of investing. So they need to fight with the help of the state. So there is a big imbalance between the digital world and the manufacturing world. And of course, I really believe this is a bubble, okay? Because if this digital revolution connected to the increase of value was real, but you would see something in terms of GDP growth happening. You would see productivity raising. You would see job created. You do not see that, okay? So there is this balance also create hypes because these companies have a lot of money to invest, but actually there is no the real economy that could absorb all the money they have. And so they create this kind of digital crazy project like the autonomous vehicle on which I do not believe at all, by the way, and which is part of this story for me. Okay, so the hype is real. Uh, so this is literature, this is just scientific literature, it's the web of science and you see in blue the citation of articles, scientific articles that use industry for zero and you see that from nothing it goes up to more than 4,000 articles every year, which for example is more than the article that used sociology in the title, just to give an example. And you see that it, it oversteps all the others. But all the others are, are going up. But you see there is a peak. Uh, as hype are supposed to last five, six years, according to most of the literature. And you see in 2019, 2020, 2021, it starts to, I mean, it doesn't grow up anymore. It's, just, it's typical, it's a peak and then it goes down. So perhaps we are in the process of fading of the hype, but still to see. Why is fading? Because we do not see this happening, okay? If you look at cobots, well, we don't find them. Uh, I, I've been in many car factories in the last five years. You do not see them. They're just not there, okay? And yes, robots are still increasing, but this is mostly what is called catch-up automation. These are standard articulate robots, and you find them in China, in India, in place where the cost of work is going up, so companies are basically following up the step of automation that you had before in, in Western companies. There's nothing new about that, and the most advanced robots are still extremely marginal. Ecobots are the most marginal of all. When you look at uh, Internet of Things, in car companies, for instance, it's very difficult. And there's a lot of barriers because you need to define common standards. And companies are very reluctant to, suppliers very reluctant to let his, uh, his, his car maker to have access to his data. And competitors are very reluctant to share data between them. And uh, logistics are very reluctant to share data. So they do share data, of course, but they don't want to have everything interconnected. They don't want something that moves around the supply chain and provides information to everybody. So it's very difficult to define the common standard. 3D printing. Yes, if you look at prototypes, it's very important. So when it comes to make prototypes, 3D print is very useful. But mass production, no, at least in the automotive industry. So you see some in the aerospace because it's much more small scale production, much higher value added, but in mass production, you don't see 3D printing. What you see is digital wearables devices, tablets, smart glasses, smart gloves, which provide more control over workers, but that's not really a revolution. So concerning robots again, this is Germany, which is the earthland of the industry for zero concept. While well, robots in the automotive industry are been stable for the last 10 years, and actually the assembly robots are going down. So, so basically, the industry is moving away from the idea of robotizing assembly rather than accelerating that under this concept. So that's why you can talk about a hype. Yes? So this is the stock of assembly robots uh, in total in the, German in the German industry as a whole, and this is their share of all industrial robots. So if you want, you have, you have seen since the 90, 90s an increase in non-assembly robots, but in the field of assembly where you have most of the human beings, where you would be expect to see this revolution taking place and human beings being substituted by assembly robots, where actually this is not happening. This has been stagnating and as a share of the total is going down. I will go back with more data. You don't see increase in productivity 
for example. Uh, you, the number of, of people employed in the automotive industry, the number of cars produced, is not changing dramatically even when the stock of robots is going up. So you don't see this impact. I, I will go back with more data on that, but thanks for the question. So as I told you before, a hype, nevertheless, is not something that does not have an effect. But nevertheless, the literature suggests that uh, when the literature about what is called technological expectation tells us, yes, they do have an effort, but there are limits to what they can do. Okay, so the concept of performativity comes from linguistic and is about uh, utterance that basically say they make something happen. If I say right now, well, my, my presentation is over and I walk away, of course, I will make, I will make this session end. Okay? If, if somebody declares a word, well, the word starts if he's a prime minister, or if he declares somebody married, well, they are married. So there are phrases that make something happen. So the idea of performativity, if there are concepts in management, in economy, like economic theory, and in the technological expectation, they do not describe the world. They do not describe something that is happening. But they're, if they are used, uh, the, the probability that what they describe becomes true increase. So that is the performativity. More a concept is used, more what it describes start to appear in the world. So you can talk about the degree of performativity. So about Industry for Zero, the question is how much of Industry for Zero is actually happening, and even if you know it's a hype. But this literature just tells us, be aware that technological expectations are becoming more and more popular, but also more and more are realistic because there is a market of technological expectations. So different technological providers are fighting to secure space for their innovation. So they need to sell revolution. So that's why you see revolution all around the world. You know, basically, everything is a revolution today uh, in all the fields because you have these technological providers who are fighting to capture public money and private attentions and financial uh, attentions uh, to uh, be valued and to obtain resources. So, for example, Brown in 2003 said, in so many cases, the present fails to measure up to the expectation once held of it. And this can have disastrous consequences for the reputation not only of individuals, but entire innovation field. So the danger now is that when the hype goes away, finally, not so much remains of it. Now, now we'll move to the final part of my presentation about the automotive sectors and I explain to you why this sector that was expected to be at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution finally has not changed much during the last 10 years, has not started to buy this technology, has not moved really to smart factories. So the first thing that we need to understand is that this is a very difficult buyer because it's a very high capital intensive industry with small margin. So this is a very important person, is Louis Schweitzer, who was the CEO of Renault, and at the time of speaking, is, is the commissioner to investment in France. So he's the person who's in charge of public investment, where the state puts his money. Okay? So he's talking to uh, a, an inquiry that is made after the diesel gate by the National Assembly, and he says, but the essential factor in the automobile industry is the reduction of cost. While in other technological sectors, such as aviation and defense, this constraint is much less important. So my experience in the automobile makes me believe that flexible production lines with robots are not a good solution in the long term for larger volumes because they generate extra costs and a loss of efficiency. In Kibben researching for small series, it talks about V6 and V8, which are luxury kind of uh, engines. Besides, the flexibility is often only theoretical. Innovation requires changes that were not those which were expected initially. We do, however, support automatization where flexibility is an advantage. So basically saying there are sectors where industry for zero can be implemented. Aerospace, defense, small scale production, very advanced, very high margin. But in mass production, not really. These technologies are not ready for mass production. Now I will propose to look at these things from a kind of regional perspective, but I hope it will, it will give you a better picture of that. So let's try to think about technology in terms of price per kilogram. The way you think about products when you go to buy in a supermarket, you don't often think in these terms when you buy technological products, but you see there are huge differences. Okay? This is a little bit old data, I didn't have the time to, to update, it's 2016, so you see the iPhone 6S, which is of course out of fashion. But 
What is important is the price per kilo, 5,000 kilograms when you buy a, a smartphone. Of course, I could put a cheaper one, but still very expensive by kilograms. When you buy an airplane, well, it's expensive, but much less so by kilograms. It's between 1,300, 1,500 euros. When you got to the cheapest computer in the market, more or less, it's 145 euros. Okay? It's still expensive, and perhaps if you take the cheapest Android phone, you, smartphone, you don't get to that, but something between. When you move to cars, you see, we're in completely different domains. It's 23, this is the most sold car in Europe in 2016, 23 euros per kilogram. And if you go at very cheap cars in India, you get to five euros a kilogram. A car is still a very complex product. He has more lines of code than an airplane right now in terms of what you put as a computer. He has thousands of parts that are moving. You have very complex powertrains. It's very difficult to manufacture a car. That's why you have a handful number of companies in the world that can do it. And they're very careful about changing their manufacturing systems. And mass production here is key. Volumes, volumes, volumes. So 3D printing and mass production, just forget it. Okay? Anything that can disrupt the production flow and increase the cost, no. So that's, so that's why sectoral approach is important. Sectors are very different. So if somebody would talk about you about Industry 4.0 for aerospace, well, it will tell you a different story, okay? Because it's 1,300 kilograms and a small scale production, euros per kilo, and it's a small scale production. You don't produce so many airplanes. So the constraints and the technology you use are completely different. But when we move to mass production, that's, that's a different story. So that's the first reason why the industry was very reticent okay, to buy the hype. Hmm? Okay, there is a hype. That, that's the people who also came to me. There are people from Renault, from PSA, who came to me and, and told me, we have all these consultants and all these technology providers who want to sell us this technology. And they tell us that we will achieve better productivity, yeah? but we don't know. It, it doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to make sense. So the automotive industry were very prudent about getting to that. But not only because they were tied to their money, but also because they, were, they had experienced before a massive increase in automation. So they knew what these people were talking about. They already tried to introduce robots everywhere. And they ended up with the conclusion that in some places, in particular in final assembly, it's just not possible. So, as you can see, the stock of robots per 1 million motor vehicles produced annually has increased dramatically in the automotive industry in the 1980s and 90s, and basically a stop in 1995 to increase. And in 1995, when you look at the shop floors of car producing with all the different shops, you can see that some of them are very much automated, like 90%. Stamping, when you stamp the parts for the car, welding, when they put them together, engine machining for making the parts of the car, forging, 90%. Casting plastic, again, for making parts, 70%. Painting, engine assembly, quite a lot of difference between 40 and 50. Perhaps nowadays we are closer to 70 and 80 for painting as, as, as one of the sectors that has automated most in the 1990s. But when you move to final assemblies, it's less than 10%. And it's there that you have most of the human beings. Most of the work is where all the parts come together. You know, the Henry Ford line is that place, is the final assembly. So here you have a schemes, and I will go fast on that because I have little time left, that is proposed by, by Fujimoto and, and basically tell us the story of the last 20, I mean, these years, the 1980s and 90s, and of the attempt made by several car makers to automate final assembly, the bottleneck, where all the workers were. And it basically organized in two axes, why companies want to automate final assembly and how they try to do it. Why is, particularly for Western manufacturing, was to increase productivity and quality, also to deal with the problem of workers uh, that were often uh, well, not easy to manage, in particular in France, Italy, United States at the beginning of the 1980s. So they wanted to solve two problems, quality and manufacturing problem, but also socialist and uh, not very friendly industrial workers who want to take over, take control of the factories, and labor market performance, which is the 
almost the opposite. Companies that could not find any more workers and they need to recruit them. So they needed to make the manufacturing process more human friendly in order to make older workers, women work on the line. And that was the case of Japan and Sweden, for example. So that's the history, I go very fast. So early 1980s, these Western car manufacturers like Fiat, General Motors, Volkswagen, tried to go full automated, tried to automate final assembly. They create very expensive factories with a lot of robots, and they failed. These factories were extremely rigid, not flexible. Uh, they were prone to a lot of accidents and that would stop production. They were very costly and they were less efficient than more standard factories. The most efficient factories were the Japanese one. And that became evident in the 1980s. And the Japanese one actually were factories where in final assembly you see very little robots. It's low cost automation. Automation is made to help workers do their job, not to substitute for them, because the whole organization is built around teams. Teams of workers who take care of lean flow of production, they improve the standards, they look for quality, they stop the line, they are the core of the assembly, and Japanese companies do not want to automate final assembly. But, so what happened is that in the 1980s, all these companies moved towards lean production. Our automate factories are not working, let's become lean. Yet, at the same time, that's a paradox, Japanese companies had problems in recruiting workers in Japan because lean production is extremely hard and it makes the work very intense and it needs a lot of extra time, for instance. So Japanese workers in a booming economy in the 1980s with a demographic problem, while well, young Japanese workers did not want to work there anymore. So Japanese companies decided to try to solve the problem first by automating all the tasks that were not ergonomically friendly. And then they decided just to make lean less lean, introducing buffer, uh, extending the cycle time. And so that creates a more human lean approach, but with no robots. And finally, well, I would not speak about that even it's very interesting. There was this Udevala Volvo project of making an assembly line without an assembly line. So the idea is to assemble the car in a fixed station. You add two up to eight workers in a fixed station assembling the old cars with cycle time between eight and 12 hours. Just an amazing project, but it didn't work out. And there the automation was about to bring the car and bring the parts with different automated devices. And it was a very interesting project, but it was abandoned. So basically in the 1990s, 2000, 2010, is lean, which dominates. And lean is low cost automation, team works, and no robots in final assembly. Yes? Low cost automation is that you don't put sophisticated robots to substitute with human beings. You just put, uh, uh, for example, a mechanical arm that the workers can use to lift heavy things. You can put uh, another device that helps the, the workers to put down the engine when it merged with the chassis. So they're all devices that help the workers to empower them to, to make more demanding physical tasks, but they do not substitute for them. They're not intelligent. They do not, they do not program themselves. They, they're just tools that the human beings use in the assembly process. No, they're not cobots because the cobots are intelligent robots that they program themselves or they can be programmed and they interact with human beings. But in a certain sense, you're right. Cobots would not be, uh, well, the cobots we see are basically are, are small devices that provide parts to the workers or select parts that need to be assembled. So it fits with rather the low cost automation and we do not see prospect to see cobots taking over uh, human beings in the assembly line. So Industry for Zero is an attempt to revive all the high-tech automation. So to say, now the robots are more clever, more flexible, we can bring them into the line. But in fact, when you look more concretely, it's rather a tool to support lean. So that's why we don't see with the Industry for Zero big change in terms of robots. Uh, robots are not coming back to the assembly line. What we see is that it provides a digital interface for the lean production environment, which as I said, 
is exert a lot of pressures. There is no margins in limb production. There is, uh, the, the, the pace of work is very intense. Uh, and so the, 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 the industry for zero technology rather comes as a complementary technology for limb production more than a revival of high-tech technology. So some evidence. This is the stock of industrial robots in the automotive industry per thousand blue colors, so it's the density of robots in Germany, United States, and Japan. And you can see that by the time the Industry for Zero concept was a hype, well, basically the density of robots has stagnated or even has decreased dramatically in Japan and is only slightly increased in Germany. So no evidence of a fast increase of robots, of automation of final assembly line. When you look at the number of workers, they're stable. Here in the United States, this decline is due to the fact that um, well, the big three have been going bankrupt. Uh, do you remember in 2008, 2009, Chrysler and, and GM were bankrupt? So a lot of employment was lost there. And the Japanese companies who took over the market share uh, used much less workers. So that's the reason why they declined. But you see there is no correlation between robots and level of employment. And the same goes for production. Production are pretty stable in all the three markets. So no impact on productivity, no impact on employment, no more stocks of robots. So clearly no evidence at all of high automation strategies coming back to the shop floor in the car industry. So what is happening? What is happening is that you see more digital devices in the shop floor, that's for sure. So you see a system system, uh, in particular in maintenance, which is a bottleneck in lean production environment. You can think of a lean factory as a factory that can potentially work when needed, 24 hours a day, seven days a week when needed, and then machines become a bottleneck. Human beings can have for that for a short period of time, Machines and the maintenance of machines is problematic. So they hope to develop smart maintenance. And so to use computer to anticipate when a machine will break down and to centralize the maintenance of machine in data centers and therefore the skill the maintenance workers who will be there to just execute tasks that will be coordinated by more kind of scientific kind of workers in the data centers. So there is a risk of distilling using this device. You can see in catch-up automation, these, these hypes have created more opportunity for a lot of companies, in particular in developing worlds, to buy robots. So we see not new generation of robots, but standard robots and more catch-up automation. So this is articulated with more polarization on the shop floor, in particular concerning temporary workers and fixed workers. And so there is a, a risk of seeing more fragmented employment relationship in, in car factories, which help employers to keep wages down. Um, and we see more control. We see a lot of digital devices that are there to be, make sure that workers do what they're told to do, to follow the standards, and to make so the environment um, more kind of disciplinary oriented in terms of what the people do. Uh, I will not develop that at the end of my time. Uh, I will just summarize what these changes mean in terms of how we understand the impact of Industry for Zero in the car industry and in the shop floor. These changes are not driven by technological change. It's not because new technology are there, are available, that dictate companies to use in that way. It's companies who decide to use this technology to pursue different strategic objectives. And we see that because when we look at different car makers and at different countries, we see different outcomes. So for example, in Germany, where trade unions negotiate the introduction of this technology, several colleagues have shown that actually workers gain discretionary power and autonomy in using this technology. Because it can be used to protect workers. Because if, if you have a digital device that tell you exactly what you are supposed to do, for example, it would be difficult later on for a supervisor to tell you that you've done something wrong. So that relinquish, for example, a certain degree of pressure on the workers uh, when they do the work. And also they can be more autonomous because they can acquire more knowledge about that. But if you move to Italian factories or French factories still in Europe, where trade unions are much weaker, you can see that these technologies are really used to enforce discipline, to increase work pace to make the work harder and to create less possibility for the workers to resist against that. So it really depends on 
company strategies, labor relationship environment, and uh, also what the company are trying to do. Are they trying to reduce costs? Are they trying to improve quality? If you look at premium car makers, for example, you see that they want to increase production abroad. Uh, typically, BMW or Daimler, for many years, they produce their cars only in Germany. And they would trust only the high-skilled workers to produce their cars. So when they go to produce cars in Mexico and China, they say, well, let's use this technology to be sure that our Chinese and Mexican workers uh, do exactly as our German workers do. So they use this technology to ensure higher standard of quality. So depending on the companies, depending on the context, these technologies are used in different ways. So it still means that it's, it's a human, social, mediated question. It's not a technological revolution that falls upon the industry. It's something that is mediated by the actors, which is something, I guess, that is quite obvious, but it's still important to, to say it. And I think I finish with my presentation. <laughs> so hi, everybody. Um, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to speak without the mask. If anybody minds, just speak up. OK. So uh, my name is Roman. I'm from Major A. And uh, I'm from Belarus. Uh, we are going to present today with Deborah. Uh, Deborah, you are from Nigeria, right? Yes, I'm from Nigeria. I'm from Major C. Yeah, and um, thank you very much, Mr. Pardew, for the presentation. Uh, we did enjoy the article. Uh, I don't say that just just because we are in the environment where we are. <laughs> uh, um, uh, there will be some slides in the presentation that we prepared that are repetitive. Uh, so um, we will we will try to skip them and uh, go to the discussion so that we have more time to discuss all the things that are related to the topic. So we'll present the fourth industrial revolution concepts in the automotive sector: performativity, work, and employment. And um, you already presented the idea of the fourth industrial revolution. We thought it was important so that everybody is on the same track to understand what it is. And the idea is basically, yes, as you said, to have machines that will be interconnected and that will be generating data, uh, collecting data, exchanging data, and using it uh, for better performance. Uh, smart factories are the end goal of the industrial of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, where production, maintenance, logistics will be managed by uh, artificial intelligences, technologies, and uh, um, the key thing I think here is that across the whole value chain, uh, these technologies will be used. Um, why the automotive sector is at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution for several reasons. Historically, it was a pioneer in introducing new manufacturing technologies such as uh, lean manufacturing, mass manufacturing. It is also one of the largest and most capital intensive industries. As you mentioned, 40% of the world stock of operational robots are in this, uh, in this industry. But there is still a sizable amount of unskilled and relatively well-paid workers, so it shows that there is potential for automation. Uh, there is also increase in variety and degree of customization, and some numbers that you again mentioned that fewer than 8% eight tas eight of tasks in the U.S. transportation equipment industry are automated, and there is a potential of 53%. And at the world level, this potential would rise to 85%. And these figures are not just for the developed countries. For developing countries, there are also uh, quite large numbers from 40 to 75% of potential of automation. Uh, so what does the fourth industrial revolution promise us? Uh, mostly all the good things. Uh, productivity gains, better and more diversified products, better work conditions. The only drawback seems to concern the employment. Uh, what's going to happen with the people that will be replaced by machines? And in this case, governments and firms are expected to promote these technologies, as I said, in order to benefit from all the good things. Uh, and they should anticipate the related massive 
jobs losses by introducing or reforming the lifelong training schemes that will also provide the fewer but more skilled uh, workers uh, who will interact with collaborative robots and smart technologies. Um, this is a very interesting concept that you have already <laughs> described. Uh, that was the first time that I came across this concept in your article. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just skip it then. But it is important to understand um, to use this concept to understand the future of the um, fourth industrial revolution. Because if I understood it correctly, it's very much linked to the idea of self-fulfilling prophecies, right? Uh, like what we expect, what. Uh, what we expect, we start to prepare for that, and our actions in the present are actually shaped by our expectations of the future. While in reality, well, the common logic would be that our present actions will define the future, not the other way around. Uh, so it is too early to, to speak about the degree of performativity of the industry for zero, because uh, well, these concepts and visions are not scientifically grounded forecasts of probable futures, but political projects that aim at shaping improbable futures. And uh, while these concepts have certainly gained uh, strong visibility and political support, it is reasonable to assume that these visions of the future are overly optimistic. So these are the historical patterns that you have just covered. Um, I, w I think I will not stop here. Yeah, so I will I will give uh, the floor to uh, to you, Deborah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so we get to that part of the discussion where we ask ourselves: Is there really a fourth industrial revolution, or is it just another hype, or could it be just a global competition? So um, I'll be discussing the three major manufacturing exporters, which is China, um, Germany, and the United States of America. So we'll try to look at um, their digital revolution concepts to answer this question. So um, I'll just try to give a, a brief antecedent of what um, led to this um, digital revolution concept. So um, due to the 90s reform and opening of China's economy, so many manufacturing industries of the United States, they moved production into um, China. And um, this actually um, negatively impacted unemployment rates in the United States of America. It also gradually led to trade deficits, a uh, loss of basis of continued innovation, and an over-reliance on uh, manufacturers of original equipment abroad. So like moving forward in the year 2010, it happened that um, China took the lead from the United States of America, and they became the manufacturing superpowers. So we then asked ourselves, is this um, a major push for the advanced manufacturing initiative? So on the other hand, we have the Made in China 2025, um, a manufacturing concept that has already been introduced to us before. So then we just say, OK, is it basically for competing with other countries like um, Japan and Germany? So we just have a glance of the digital revolution concepts. The first one is um, Industry 4.0, which was introduced by Germany, Advanced uh, Manufacturing Initiative by the United States, and Made in China 2025. So basically, like um, this um, three digital revolution concepts is just to revitalize the manufacturing sector. So then we ask ourselves, like, what is the main drivers for these um, three concepts that we just uh, mentioned? So for Germany, is to develop a new generation of virtual reality integrated manufacturing technology, and basically to maintain advantages in the global manufacturing sector. Then for the United States, is to um, boost um, production flows, create domestic employment opportunities, uh, restore manufacturing competitiveness, and promote innovation, personal training, and shaping the industrial revolution. And for China, in short, it's just to become the manufacturing power by 2049. So um, let me just um, quickly um, go through the um, Industry 4.0. Okay, so um, it was um, first introduced um, in 2006, and, and the Industry 4.0 basically was um, developed in 2013. 
So um, generally, the vision of the Industry 4.0 is to develop the smart factory, a concept that uh, we already had. So how will Germany achieve this smart factory? So the first is by integrating fragmented IT infrastructures in company, by collecting process-related data systematically, and applying new techniques to provide real data analysis for process control and process optimization. Then another concept, which we also had, assistance systems. So basically, this assistance system is just to provide information for workers. It's just trying to guide them on all the production process. And um, the industry 4.0 basically is funded by the central government. And another important thing for us to know that it's politically supported. So for the um, United States, the Advanced Manufacturing Initiative. So the AMI was launched in 2011 and formed the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership in 2012. So the mission of um, the Advanced Manufacturing um, Partnership basically is to bring together industries, uh, universities, and the federal government to invest in the emerging technologies that will create high quality manufacturing jobs and enhance global competitiveness. And in 2014, um, the Revitalized American Manufacturing and Innovation, that's the RAMI Act, which you asked before, was signed into law, authorizing the creation of um, National Manufacturing Innovation Institute. And um, currently, um, in the United States, they have um, 16 manufacturing institutes. So basically, uh, it is geared towards um, um, increasing innovation, collaboration and education. And this program is funded either by the Department of Commerce, Defense or Energy. So we have this picture of um, the uh, Made in China 2025. So for the um, digital revolution concept of Made in China 2025, yeah, they have 10 core industries which we can see around. And basically for China, like I repeat again, is to become um, the leading manufacturing superpower by 2049. So how will they achieve this? So China aims to utilize um, innovative manufacturing technologies to continue to move up the manufacturing value chain. And um, it's going to be funded by the states. So now, coming to uh, the main discussion of today, we try to ask ourselves this question. Is automation in the automotive sector a global force that is going to transform the workforce um, or the economy generally. So from the text, we got this. In the last years, at least in high wage European location, in the automotive industry, there has not been a great boost in the field of automation. So um, again, for, you know, we are, we are talking about um, the top three manufacturers, which is China, Germany, and US. So for China and, uh, sorry, for Germany and the United States, in both cases, they say there is no evidence of major disruptive breakthrough of completely new technologies. And for um, China, we say it can be characterized as catching up with the standards of international manufacturing organization rather than forging ahead. So um, this, uh, it says that in China, basically, the, their main incentive to introduce automation is basically because of the rising um, minimum wage, regional labor shortages, and increased quantity demand from the customers. So we may ask why. Is there any automation? So like we already heard from the presentation, this is the, uh, the possibility to automate the body shop and paint shop are almost exhausted. So the only area that is heavily dominated by the manual work remains the final assembly. And we already know why it's very problematic. It's, um, it's caused so much, so I mean, it's not a solution. So we've already seen this graph, so I don't think I need to go on this again. Okay, so we also looked into um, the robot density in the manufacturing industry. So as we can see, um, Germany has the largest robot market in Europe, and we can see that the employment rate in this country, I mean, it has increased. So it's more like, um, even with the um, robotics um, narrative, there is still employment. And for China, which is the um, largest um, car manufacturer, we can see that um, they, they rank number 15, but now we stand in, I mean, it's not really affecting um, the workplace. So yeah, we are not blind to the fact that automation will clearly have an impact on workplaces and workers. But it's not going to happen that um, robots are going to replace man. So we look at the pros. I think um, you already mentioned 
uh, basically everything, yes. But aside for the cons, I think I'm just going to um, elaborate on problems with employees' data. So um, it's a major issue in the digital transformation. So how would this employee's data be used? Would it be used for profit sake or that's a question that uh, we'll look into. Then, okay, you already mentioned, the, okay, also um, threatened social right of workers. So for instance, I was just discussing with Raman while we we're preparing for the presentation. I said, oh yeah, in this fourth industrial revolution, it happens that many of these workers, um, they're employed on contractual basis. So, would they be um, included in the health insurance? So it's a problem because, I mean, the health and safety of workers is something that is um, needed. So I'll give the word to Raman to conclude. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Um, so, yes, to conclude, basically all the things that we already heard, that hypes and fashions, they capture firms and states' action, and uh, the probability that their visions of the future become true increases, but their chances of turning into self-fulfilling prophecies still remain low. Uh, however, they, they do have uh, important side effects uh, that can uh, trigger sometimes profound transformations in the organization of production at work. Uh, secondly, the scope for a digital manufacturing revolution taking place in the automotive sector appears limited as companies have other huge capital costs and the conditions for automation that were present previously are not present anymore, uh, such as important gaps in productivity between uh, leading and uh, lagging companies and shortages of skilled and unskilled manpower that are willing to work in uh, automotive factories. And the third point is about trade unions and um, trade unions and social partners can and should participate and shape in the processes of technological change by using and sharing the knowledge of real work such situations and experimentations by cooperating with universities and social scientists in order to build a collective empirically grounded understanding of ongoing and forthcoming processes of technological change so that it doesn't so it's not just a history of hypes and fashions and it's not just something that uh, happens because the governments decide the, that it needs to happen. That shouldn't be the top bottom approach, but the people who actually have real life experience with, with the technologists and who will work with them, they also should have a say in, uh, in the development of the narrative. So we came up with some questions for discussion. Um, <laughs> Elon Musk's name is gonna come up. Uh, so, um, electric vehicle manufacturers seem to be more geared to take advantage of technological leapfrogging and build more automated factories. Elon Musk, for example, claims that 75% of operations at Tesla plants are automated. And with an increasing number of governments setting new objectives for phasing out the sales of new uh, IC vehicles, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles and tightening of CO2 emissions standards, what would be the impact of the growing adoption of electric vehicles on the automation rates in the automotive industry? Uh, the second question, um, in the USA for 2019, the automotive manufacturers only employed 23.6% female workers, slightly below the average share for the last two decades, which was 25.2%. Uh, women have never accounted for more than 27.8% of automotive manufacturing workers. Uh, is there any hope of the fourth industrial revolution to narrow gender gaps present in many industries? Uh, we're not sure how this um, is connected directly with the fourth industrial revolution but uh, maybe you have an opinion on that so that would be interesting to know and um and finally yes um the the concern that deborah just read about data privacy the human robot interactions are as good as the data that uh, machines are fed and this raises the question of data privacy uh, so workers data protection will be one of the issues for trade unions, including trade unions, in the digital work, uh, in, the in the digital world of work. 
uh, in your opinion, do trade unions have the capacity to negotiate putting in place the necessary privacy regulations? And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, how, how do I reply? I, I you, can, you can go there so that we'll I do. step there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your questions. They're very good ones. Really. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 I have the mic. So. So yes. Thank you for uh, resuming very well the article. So concerning the questions, yes, Elon Musk has claimed indeed and has tried to uh, highly automate its factory. By the way, this is a, an historical factory. I don't know if, if there was this factory called NAMI that was the first joint, I mean, the first Toyota factory in North America. It was a joint venture between General Motors and Toyota and it was located in California. And, uh, and that was a revolutionary factory uh, already. Uh, and there was a kind of conflict between the um, conflict, a theoretical conflict between NAMI, that was the, say, the laboratory for limb production introduction in North America and, and the westward, and Udevalla, the, the factory I told you about briefly of Volvo, uh, which was the kind of social technical alternatives in which people, as I say, assemble the cars in a fixed station. Uh, you can find videos on YouTube if you, if you type Udevalla you will see it's, it's quite, I mean, it's quite in incredible as to see um, just the whole car being assembled in a fixed stations and with workers, you know, just working with different tasks for four or five hours. And so, so that was NAMI, and, and NAMI won, okay? So NAMI became the most visited factory in the United States, the most studied factory in the United States, and was the simplification of while in production was superior and everybody should convert to that. Now, Eventually, NAMI failed in the sense that with the bankruptcy of, of, um, of GM in 2009, it was closed. And for a short period of time, Toyota took it over and then he sold it to Elon Musk. So the factory of, of Tesla is actually this, this factory that has been taken by Musk. So indeed, Musk has used some of digital technologies like, like I mean, we, we don't have, unfortunately, sociologists or any other researchers have not been invited or let in into the Tesla factory, so we don't know exactly what has been happening. We know that it's been very difficult. I, I remember the Model 3 when it was launched, they couldn't manufacture them, manufacture it, and it, it took a lot of work to figure out how. There's been rumors of the fact that the workers are bad paid and there was attempts of unionization. So, it's not been on that side, on, on the financial side, everything was wonderful for Musk, but on the manufacturing side, the story is pretty complicated. And as far as I know, but is, is something I've read, and so I could not provide empirical evidences for that. The, the attempts to heavily robotize has been a failure and has moved back in order to scale up the Model 3 to much more labor intensive manufacturing process. And he has hired some professionals from Ford and, and GM to take care of the organization of the shop floor. So, so this is the story of Musk. Then on the fact that the electric cars is, contains much less parts. And so if you have dedicated platform just for the electric cars, you could think of about automating more than in a conventional lines. That is partially true. And I've heard about that, that there is this possibility. And for example, Volkswagen have created recently a new factory in Poland, which has very high level of shop floor automation, but it's still it, it just very high level by Polish standard. So it's high, it's as high as German, okay, but it's not much higher than the current German level of automation for Volkswagen. So there is a debate about that because it's less parts, but it's more complicated due to the all electric electronic system, the management of the battery. So uh, short. Uh, there is no, for the time being, the experts have been listened to, they say the time required to assemble the car will not be very different, there might be some more automation, but in terms of assembly, the, the, the electric cars will not destroy a lot of jobs. In terms of the powertrain and all the materials needed to make the powertrains, yes, the, a lot of jobs will be gone there, just because they will substitute with the battery and, and an electric engine, that requires a lot less workers, but for the, for the assembly process, uh, there is a debate. So you're pointing to something that it does exist, but for the time being, 
the idea is that it will not be a radical break. Uh, nevertheless, this is an open question, so very good, very good point. Then on the women gender dimensions, that's very interesting because there is, we have just last month replied to a joint research concert, which is the European um, kind of research center for the European Union, call for, for, um, call for application for a project that aims at looking at two sectors, the textile and the automotive sectors in Spain, Germany and Romania, uh, looking at the automation uh, how, how this automation has been evolving these two sectors in the last years and looking at also its, at the impact on gender. And one of the hypotheses behind it is that in the textile, if the automation increase, which is a very female oriented sector, they say, is there the possibility that how the employment becomes more skilled? Because you will have, with the automation, you will have less employers, but they will control machines. You might see male em uh, employees getting into the textile sectors. So this hypothesis of, of more, the upskilling would actually reduce the gender gap in textiles because companies would rather hire male skilled workers rather than female unskilled workers. And for the automotive sector, the idea is that the automation could reduce the physical burden of the assembly line and the force since in some like in Germany, there is a problem of recruiting workers for the German automotive industry in Germany, not, not in Europe. So they might be looking at more female workers in particular for part-time workers uh, that are needed, like, like temporary workers that could be more female and added to the, to the... So this question of the gender gap and how it is evolving is actually I mean, another good point because this is a topic and I don't have an answer about that. I visit some factories when you see recently, like the PSA factory in, in Savile Nord in, in the north of France, where I, where I was surprised to see many young women in the assembly line. But I visited, I, I didn't study it. So it, it, it is important to know who they are. Are they temporary workers, permanent workers, why they were hired, is, is the day shift, is the night shift? Uh, that requires more and more, so that's why Hopefully we will get the project and we know more in the future. Uh, the last questions, uh, just remind me. Uh, about data privacy. Data privacy, this is a big question indeed. In Germany is, is, is very important in the sense that it's not only about, it's, it's about data privacy, but it's also about uh, the control of, of workers. And the two are correlated to a certain extent. Because if the data which is expected to improve the efficiency is used to track people at the work and what they do and use to discipline them or punish them. This is seen by the trade unions as a threat they don't, they do not want to do that. So they want that the data is used anonymously to improve things or to collect information about how things are done but not used as a disciplinary tool. And so in a country like Germany, surely this is an important question. In Europe in general, where there is European regulations which are very strong and you have a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, tribunal for workers, complaints and trade unions that are present. I think this is an important topic. If we move in countries like China or India, I don't think this is a factor at all. So it really depends on the, on the context in which this is happening. But this is a clear an issue. Uh, and it's also an issue for all the automated mobility, for example. Uh, so would you be ready? that your car can be tra tracked, that you, the way you drive can be tracked, the way if you m drive correctly or not, uh, because your car is connected, uh, and how are you sure that your data is protected, and how it's managed by companies. These are very important barriers, because if the data is not protected, then the whole business model collapses in a place like United States or Europe. So these are the digitalization this, these elements of, of the privacy of the data, the management of the data, where they are stored and how they're used, is a key question, a juridical question, and represent sometimes very strong barriers to actually introduce this technology in these environments. Hope I, I answer all your questions, and I'm ready for other questions if there are. <laughs>